All right. Um, so th thanks, Nicola, for the introduction and everything. Um, so I hope everybody is able to see what I'm seeing on my screen. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Adrian. I'm the project coordinator and training consultant on this joint project uh, involving the ARDC, Bond University, the University of New South Wales, and the University of Sydney. So today I'll be presenting on behalf of my other project team members, uh, Adele Hayton wade Brock Eski, and Jackie Cho. Our contact details will be provided in the slides later. And of course, at the end of this uh, session, uh, we will email you the slide deck and some other instructions too. Okay. So today's session will be in three parts. We will start with some context setting as well as what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, then I'll show you some of the Pisces highlights based on the prototype. So whenever I use the term Pisces, I'm referring to the RDM training experience that we're developing and testing. So Pisces stands for Principles Aligned Institutionally Contextualized Training. And finally, the last section will be a bit of a hands-on. I will provide a walkthrough of how you can be involved in this project and to provide feedback on Pisces. So just a bit of a background here, the ARDC and participating unis are developing an institutional underpinnings framework uh, that will inform the management, sharing, retention, and disposal of data across all universities. In other words, we are working towards having more consistent and coordinated RDM practices across the sector. So as a part of the IU project, Bonn University, University of Sydney, and UNSW have banded together to see if it's possible to develop a common principles-based introductory RDM training that can be adapted based on the uni's context. So context in terms of policies, processes, and systems. And the long-term pretty ambitious goal here is that if the PIC RDM training is raw in all institutions, um, there will then be a raise of baseline awareness of RDM best practices, which will, one, assist researchers to make informed decisions around managing their data, and two, given that there's a principles aligned RDM training across institutions, this most likely would facilitate cross-institutional management of data. I mean, that's the ultimate goal that we're heading towards. So there are some baseline RDM competencies that have been so-called identified by the uh, IU framework, which is now out for consultation. Um, so I think at this point in time, there are like 12 required competencies that's in the document itself. I've highlighted RDM areas in green. The orange and gray areas sort of indicates how much focus is given to an RDM area in our PIC training. So for example, for competencies that require actions like applying or determining, these are highlighted in orange and will be given a little bit more focus in our training. And for competencies that relates to thinking like knowledge or awareness, those are highlighted in gray. So in a way, this minimum competency helps us ring fence what should be covered in our PIC training. So from the RU framework and also from the collective RDM experiences at the three universities, Riff came up with uh, these objectives to sort of ring fence the PIC design and content. So the first one acknowledges that training is just a piece of the puzzle if you're trying to go after behavioral change, you know, RDM best practice here. That said, whatever we are doing here has to join up with uh, and also be consistent with uh, university policies, processes, and systems. The second objective is that the PIC is specifically designed with new HDRs in mind, and it's only about getting them started with RDM. And this links back to the ICU baseline competencies or minimum competencies. And there is a thinking and doing component to it. And finally, the third objective here, um, in, in order for the PIC to be engaging and effective, the content will be highly contextualized, but with, without losing the common RDM principles component of it. Um, the training will also be designed such that it will be relevant to their early project phase, the HDR project phase. The upshot here is that it means that there will be certain competencies that will be foreground in our training. Okay, so this slide gives everyone a high level overview of how the PIC, how, how PIC was developed or materialized. So over the last couple of months, uh, we have jointly developed a RDM principles version. As you can, that's the green color track below. And from that principles version, we have created contextualized versions of it. So you can see the different tracks coming out from it. You know, it's sort of like spin off, spin -off of, uh, of it. So through this co design process, we found that while we are three very different universities, there is in fact a common RDM ground that we can fall back on. So this snapshot really shows that, you know, in a way we can be same, same, but yet different. 
so this slide uh, sort of packs, uh, it's really a summary of our RDM training or RDM experience that we are developing here. So again, we are focusing on new HDRs somewhere within three to six months of their candidature. Uh, content focus, it's really introductory and baseline. And the objective, as I mentioned before, there's a thinking component, which is thinking about RDM. And also hopefully they will be able to enact RDM best practices. Um, we are targeting somewhere between 75 minutes to 90 minutes for an, for an average user to complete the experience. And we have sort of structured it around eight different sections. Eight sections seems like a lot, uh, but quite a, few, quite a fair bit of the sections just take a couple, just take somebody a couple of minutes to go through. So that shouldn't be that onerous. Um, in the next slide, I would then you know, unpack those sections a little bit more. And at the end of the training, at the end of this PIC training, uh, there are some demonstrable outcomes that we hope the HDRs would exhibit. So for instance, uh, the training is designed such that there'll be activities, oops. So the training is designed such that there will be activities or quizzes in it embedded within the training itself. Um, and the end user can't proceed unless they get the correct answer. Um, and of course, you know, to help them get the correct answer, we will be providing feedback if they get so-called, the if they choose the incorrect options on the first attempt or second attempt. Um, and the, the quizzes or activities are really formative in nature. Uh, so they wouldn't be penalized if they keep trying. They are you know, they basically can keep trying and trying. Uh, and at the end of the training, we hope that they will start some sort of RDM plan or even submit a plan on the UNIS uh, RDMP system. Uh, and we and since they are really new HDRs, we really hope that after doing the training, they will be able to you know have a chat with their supervisors around RDM. You know, for instance, how to share their data or how to access their data. And finally, at the end of the training, we will get them to complete a survey. Uh, again, I'll provide a little bit more details about the survey, but the survey will have two components. One is really about checking their understanding and knowledge of uh, research data management. And the other component is a, really about the overall experience of the uh, training itself. So these are the eight PIC sections that we have created at this point in time. So you can see the details are there, you know, uh, and also the approximate time that it takes to complete each, each section. Um, the longer sections would definitely be the case studies. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about that also later on. I'm just going to leave it here for a couple of seconds, uh, just for everybody to have a quick look. And as mentioned, the slide deck will be uh, shared with everybody at the end of this session. So the survey items uh, that we will be using or we'll be adapting for this project comes from my previous project. Uh, we have published a paper on it. Uh, so if, I have, if you're interested, do have a look at the paper that we published. So as mentioned, it's really, there are really just two components. One is on research data management knowledge and understanding, and the other one is the quality of experience. Uh, and of course, we may tweak the um, survey items a little bit. So because this time around, the training is a bit different. Okay, so we so that's really a bit of the context setting to give everybody, everybody an idea of the background of where we're coming from and where we are heading. Uh, the next part is really just showing everybody some of the highlights based on the prototype that we have developed on iSpring. And iSpring is a authoring tool for creating online training or online experiences that is sort of based on PowerPoint, but it allows so-called interact uh, interactive interactive activities are embedded to be embedded into it. So I'm going to show you show everybody the uh, born version of that prototype. So this show this gives everybody an idea of the it's really about giving everybody an idea of the look and feel of what um, the pilot the product that we are that we'll be developing. So one of the key features is that uh, it's definitely the accessibility mode. So by clicking on that button, you know, it actually gets rid of all the extra graphics and images and just uh, display text. So this is really for people who have visual impairment who may need the screen reader. So this function will actually help uh, people, uh, those, those, those people assess the um, training. And also there's this history panel button where uh, end users can easily navigate to screens that they have previously visited. So again, just a quick overall look and feel of it. 
uh, as mentioned, we will have activities in there and the activities are interactive. You know, you can click and select options and uh, we and there'll be pop-ups to provide feedback. Uh, and some activities are really just checking in, uh, tuning in, and also just to give everybody, sometimes it's just there to give uh, the end users a mental break. And one of the key highlights uh, of our training is definitely the case studies. Um, this is to ensure that you know we are able to push con uh, information that is very relevant to the HDRs. Uh, so in this case, this case studies is really about data classification, classifying the sensitivity of their data. Um, so we get them to choose, you know, which are the data types that they they will be collecting or handling, and then clicking on one of the options there, you know, it will bring up a second menu where they can really look at, uh, they can really choose the case studies. So at this point in time, we have four groups of four buckets that we have designed. So as I mentioned, when you click on one of those uh, options, it will bring up another separate screen. So this, there's this branching option here. Um, and for instance, if somebody clicked on the lab and experiment data, they will bring up that lab, lab and experiment data menu. And from there, you know, the HDR can then choose a case study that is more that is relevant to whatever they are doing. So we are really placing the end user front and center here. So this is an example of the case study. Um, it's really short, uh, just a couple of sentences, and then we'll just ask the HDRs, you know, what do you think the classification of this data is? And then based on their selection, you know, if they get the if they choose the wrong option. We will provide feedback on or some hints on how to get the correct answers. So very formative in nature, as I mentioned. Um, and even if they get it correct, we'll reinforce uh, why they've gotten the answer correct. So these are just some of the useful features of using that iSpring authoring tool. Uh, so same thing. So that was on the, the previous one was on data classification. And then we also have case studies on data handling, where the focus is really about storage and access, uh, you know, how to, how to safely secure your data. So same thing, you know, they'll be able to select a case study that is uh, relevant to whatever they are doing. And we have broken up that, we have broken up this case study into four parts. Uh, for, so for instance, you know, they'll be at a university before their confirmation or review, what should they do? Uh, if they're out in the field collecting data, what should they do? Um, and when they are back at the university and they need to share data with their supervisors or share data with external collaborators, what should they do? And finally, when they leave the university, you know, where should they, what, what's the best place for them to uh, archive or retain their data? Oops. So this is the project timeline that, um, we are working towards. So at this point in time, we are somewhere in April and that's the reason why we're having all this consultation. And as mentioned before, uh, have I mentioned it? No. Um, yeah, so we have also conducted uh, focus groups with the HDRs, as well as running uh, similar info sessions at the three universities to get their internal stakeholders review uh, inputs and to review the content that we're doing. And hopefully if all goes well, we will be developing the pilot the pilot testing phase would come in somewhere in July and we would have a pilot uh, a pilot product for everybody to engage with them and hopefully you know everybody will be keen to provide feedback on it. Uh, and you know just to share a bit of uh, some good news uh, based on the uh, focus groups that we have conducted with 32 HDRs across the three different unis um, and yeah I also forgot to mention that you know in parallel to this project, we're also running it like a research project, and so we have gotten ethics approval for it too. Um, so this project really adopts a participatory design approach, and so it's important to involve our target end users, our HDRs in this case, in our design development process. Um, this would then lead to a product that our end users would really find useful, and that's this whole idea of this uh, participatory design approach. We want to create a product that's really useful and relevant for end users, and so we conducted focus groups with HDRs, you know, to get their inputs about what we're trying to achieve here. So, based on the focus group discussions, uh, three teams emerged. Uh, one is really on the interaction and layout, and as you can see there, these are some of the uh, feedback or inputs that were given by the HDRs. 
Um, so basically, they like the interactiveness of whatever we have developed the prototype. Uh, they like the graphics. Um, they like clicking on buttons. Uh, they feel that you know, even though it's interactive, but we call, we have designed such that there are only a couple of buttons to click. You know, it's really easy to use. So that's re that's really a good win for us at this point in time. The second one is really on the tone and language. Um, so we've designed it such that the training is uses a very conversational tone. So it feels like, you know, when you're reading it, it feels like somebody's talking to you in, a, in that way, like a coach or mentoring figure. Um, and as you can see, you know, we've, we've injected some humor into it. And so most of our HDRs do like that part, you know, there are some funny parts and there are some serious parts. Um, and even there's this one HDR, there are a couple of HDRs who, um, who, whose English is not their first language, uh, they find that language, they find the, the way we presented the language uh, very easy to use to. And yep, it's really comprehensive and easy to read. And finally, on the case studies, which is the highlight, one of the highlights of our training, um, again, they find that the examples we use were very relevant, very appropriate. Um, and the design focuses on data types instead of like research contexts or faculties. Uh, so one of the HDR said that it really works for, for him uh, because even though he's in uh, a built faculty, you know, he chose a case study that was outside his faculty because he was really focusing on the data types that he will be handling and collecting. Um, and of course the information on the data handling, you know, uh, they find it very informative and useful because it's really about storing data on supported platforms or secure platforms. So again, you know, all these things are really uh, early indications that we are on the right track. Uh, of course, you know, there will be suggestions for improvement and we take them very seriously. So uh, quite a fair bit of HDRs asking for more data types for the case studies. Um, so that, you know, it appeals to a wider group of audience. Um, and the other thing is that they are really looking for like a, some sort of, a, not really, not really a certificate, but something to, some, some takeaway as in after completing the training, they hope they are, they are able to take something away from it. Uh, so they are saying that, you know, it'd be good if there's like a one or two pager, uh, key takeaways, right? Like what are some of the important things that we've covered as well as uh, where to look for more information. So that's something that they are looking for. Uh, and the last one is not of a surprise, you know, again, because this is a prototype, there will be bugs. So for instance, blurry images and screens not displaying properly. So these are some things that we will seriously look into as we move to the next uh, development phase. Yes, so at this point, it's, yeah, that ends me, that we come to the end of me talking. Um, so, this is the information. This is our contact details. If you need to look for us, this is where you can find us. Um, I'm going to stop now just to open the floor to questions. Uh, if anybody has have any questions before we move on to the so-called hands-on phase. Uh, I have not heard. Okay, I can look at the chats. Yeah, I can um, throw chat questions to you if you like. Uh, do you think the individual eight sections or subparts could be reshuffled to be appropriate to deliver to newly hired research or supervising staff at institutions? Uh, very good question. In fact, that is a common theme that is appearing in the across the three unis because we have been very upfront to say that whatever we're doing now is just for HDRs, but a lot of the other unis are after looking at whatever we've developed, say that this might also be applicable to academic staff and supervisors. Uh, so yes, it can yeah, it can definitely be adapted. Um, but at this point in time, yeah, what we have is just the uh, HDRs one, and because it's principles based, I think we are fairly confident that you know down the road we can uh, we can adapt it for other target audience. Okay. Uh... And for professional staff too, yeah, that was yep. noted. Uh, a really cool tool. How did you talk to slash engage HDR students to begin getting them to go through the iSpring tool? Like a 10 minute talk or a whole hour run through um, with the RDMP aims, etc. Okay, so the focus group was one and a half hours long. Um, so for the first 15 minutes, 
we got them to engage with just one section of that ice spring training. So they, you know, so that one section basically gives them an idea of how to interact with it and how it looks like. And then the rest of the time for that focus group was actually spent on them looking at um, the content itself on a static digital whiteboard, which will be our next section. Uh, so on, um, so yeah. So after this Q and A, I will actually get everybody to access that mirror board, that digital whiteboard that we have developed, uh, and that's where you can look. You can actually see all our information as well as to provide feedback. Thanks, Adrian. Yep. Uh, um, what's the greatest challenge the team had to overcome in contextualizing the training for each of the three universities? The, um, all right. <laughs> so it, so it was already a challenge, uh, when we tried to develop a training for one university, you know, in the previous project. Uh, and now we were, we, we actually took on more challenges. <laughs> We took on the burden of uh, more challenges by engaging with all three universities. So I would say the challenge is really that, that is, a, is a really around building consensus um, because you know every different every university may have unique needs and requirements, but we always try to remind them you know that there is this high higher RDM principles, and what we are really trying to do here is is to focus on introductory and baseline training. So it's really about, you know, just re reminding the universities, um, the internal stakeholders that, you know, this is the scope of the project and this is what we can do based on our current resources. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, even though all three universities are, are different, but we do have a common RDM ground. For instance, you know, all three universities do see the importance of being able to classify your data first before doing anything else. So that was, you know, that was a very important thing. And then in terms of handling data, I think um, all three universities do agree that, you know, um, using supported, university supported platform is the first choice. So there are commonalities across all three universities. Hmm. Thanks. Uh, do you think the training objectives slash principles that emerged from the IU project element might change now that they're being exposed to sector feedback? <sighs> Um, in the ideal world, I hope that they will stay the same. <laughs> <laughs> but we know that, you know, it is possible that, you know, it might change. Um, but I think that we are fairly confident that most of the, most of the principles or the information that we've designed to our training, it's pretty common. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I, I mean, at least based on the experience of the three universities, you know, there, there's far more commonality than differences. So I think we should be able to work, ourselves, work around it, yeah. I think, and, and this from UNSW's perspective, I think looking at the IU principles, um, we don't feel that because they are described as minimum competencies, and we don't feel that they would change quite significantly. Um, because obviously, you know, we have, uh, each institution may have different ideas on what is the kind of ultimate and you know, best practice on data management, but um, this is really about just setting that initial baseline. You know, where what is the minimum standard that we want our HDRs to be able to do? And so far in conversations, most of the um, institutions have agreed. You know, these are just some very basic understandings that we've struggled. Um, over the last couple of years to get our HDRs to, to reach up to that level. And this is what um, both the IU um, competencies and also our training is designed to do. And it's, it's a fairly, and we believe that standard is fairly common across uh, Australian institutions. Mm. Um, how do you anticipate rolling this excellent content out to other universities? Okay, so, the reason why we chose to go with iSpring is first of all, iSpring is it's a add-on to PowerPoint. So if you you know if you are good with PowerPoint, you know it's it'll be quite easy for you to pick up iSpring. And the output of the iSpring product is actually a, a SCOM package, and we know that you know for it's actually pretty easy to deploy a SCOM package on major 
on major learning uh, management systems. So for instance, at the three universities, all three universities are using three different learning management systems. So at UNSW is Moodle, uh, University of Sydney is Canvas, and Bonn University is Blackboard. So we have, we have done some preliminary, te preliminary testing. So all the XCOM packages actually work on all three, uh, across all three universities. But, but in the end, um, but in the end, what we hope to make publicly available to everybody, to the whole sector, is uh, really the static content. And then it's really up to the universities to decide, you know, how best to deploy that static content. Um, be it, yep, so later on you'll see what I mean by when I say static content. So what we're doing is really just developing the information there. Okay, we've got just um, a couple more here. Uh, great work. The data classification module will be very useful. Have you done web content accessibility testing? How do you address accessibility requirements at each institution? Yeah, so we are not at that stage yet. As mentioned, you know, we have just done a prototype. So once we have, um, yeah, so once we have done up a, the pilot product, we'll get the each university to test out. Uh, the training at their at their own LMSs because you know even though I, I did mention that it's generic enough to be deployed across all different LMS, uh, it actually looks a little bit different when it's being deployed. So we have to do further testing on that. And then um, finally, I think a, an interesting uh, challenge: uh, Why should developing common training on RDM be such a challenge? The code for responsible conduct of research applies to all universities, and the laws disposal schedules applying to research data aren't so different from one state to another. Agreed. So that's why you know this whole this is being termed PICI, which is principles align institutionally contextualized. The principles alike part, you know, as I mentioned, you know, there is some sort of common ground which everybody agrees upon. And in this case, I think David is saying that it's true, right? There is a code of conduct and so on and so forth. And we even have a schedule for the management of data. The tricky or challenging part is really to contextualize it for the institution by putting in the institution's policies, processes, and systems. The idea is, you know, once you have a training package or information that's highly contextualized to an institution, it reduces the cognitive load for the end users, right? They don't have to make that leap to, all right, you know, how can I apply this in my setting? We make it, we make it very explicit for them, you know, in your university, this is what you should do. I hope that answered your question. Mm, yeah, and um, John adds, uh, there, uh, there was less coordination um, previously, we're working towards coordination um, in this project. I think it's also interesting to look at, yeah, the differences between universities in the ways that, yeah, uh, policies and processes are applied. Also, the differences in the way that they're structured and the way that um, RDM support uh, services are provided um, and the differences in who is responsible for providing training um, between different universities and sometimes that training doesn't all come from one place it can be kind of distributed across the different business units who are responsible for different parts of IDM so I think they those things all add up to uh, differences in at least uh, historically differences in the way that training has been provided. Yep I think well said Nicola thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can't help myself. Um, <laughs> uh, were there any other questions from the... Aha, uh -huh, here we go. Uh, this looks great. Can I ask why you've identified HDR students as the main target? Is there a plan to expand the audience for training? Uh, there are, I mean, one reason is because HDRs, it's a more accessible target audience group for pilot testing. It's easier to get them. I mean... Everybody's busy, we know, but you know, researchers tend to be busier than most people and HDRs are very happy to come. Um, it's always easier to target the new group of people, I would say. Uh, and in a way, we are, yeah, and yeah, it's just easier to ring fence that group of uh, people. It's a lot easier for our HR systems to identify who's an HDR. <laughs> I don't um, want to say that, but yeah. <laughs> we have a much more, well, I mean, from an institutional <laughs> perspective, we have a much more kind of structured um, 
management structure around um, our HDR cohorts in terms of when they can do training, when they should do training, and you know, and when they graduate and that sort of thing. Uh, with staff, it's a much more fluid process. You know, staff can move between faculties. Um, you don't really have a start and an end date for staff, really. Um, yeah, so it's a much more fluid situation for um, staff and particularly um, professional and academics staff and kind of differentiating between the two is, is sometimes difficult as well. Can I ask yeah. a follow-up question to that? Like, I mean, I think that's a very reasonable answer and like the practicality is obviously really important, but do you foresee that there are like in terms of tone or content that there'll need to be many adaptations moving between like a HDR cohort to sort of like maybe an earlier career researcher cohort or sort of, you know, beyond? So, yeah, so the principle, as mentioned, the principles will be the same across all cohorts, right? Because basically they are RDM best practice, right? So it should be the same for everyone, all researchers or, and even for professional staff. So in terms of adaptation, it will definitely be, you know, the type of maybe, you know, certain certain parts can be shorter. You don't, you don't have to have that much information or to front load. Uh, you don't have to front load too many information because, you know, assuming that, you know, they have already gone through that four years or five years uh, of research experience, you know, you, you can, you know, cut down some stuff. I think that's one, one of the thing. The other thing would be the, you know, the tone and language, things like this. Um, yeah, but we don't foresee much adaptation, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you, Helena. All right, uh, okay, let's, let's move on to the fun part. And this is where everyone here would get to see the work that we've done so far. So, but before going there, Okay, so this, so what, what, what kind of feedback are we trying to look for? So the first thing is, you know, based on what we'll be seeing next, can you, you know, uh, these are just three prompts for you to, um, to so-called frame your feedback. So one would be, you know, does the draft content achieve the PIC objective? For instance, you know, does it align to the IU framework? Uh, the other thing would be, you know, is the way that it's being designed or the information that we're pushing through, is it frame to encourage RDM best practice, for instance, secure, secure store, storage and access. And the last one, I think is the most important one is based on what you see, do you think it will be able to adapt it for use at your institution? Because as mentioned, you know, at the end of this uh, project, we hope to, to make available the principles version of the training and then you know, other universities can then adapt it for their own use. Uh, and of course, other feedback to, uh, will be welcome too. All right, so this is where I will paste the link in the chat, or where is the link? I can do uh, that, uh, there you go. All right, fantastic. All right, so can everybody click on the link? The link is a public uh, access link, so you don't need to sign in or anything. Once you click on the link, you sh it should bring up a mirror board. Uh, what does a mirror board look like? A mirror board will look like this, oops. So I hope every, yep, it will take a while for um, the mirror bot to get loaded. So if you have any issues with assessing the mirror bot, please just post something in the chat and we'll see how we can help you. Okay, I can see people coming in already. I have had, yep. So some of you may already be very, uh, familiar with Mirrorbot, but I'll just do a quick walkthrough. Let's just give a couple of, maybe a, uh, one, two minutes for everybody to join the Mirrorbot. Okay, so it's okay. I will, I will share my mirror bot screen. Okay, just in case you know some people may have some issues with uh, assessing the mirror bot. Okay, um, so I assume everyone has access to the mirror bot already. Yep. Okay. I'll try to pull everybody to me. So I think the most important thing here is that uh, bef I, um, what we are showing here, it's really the principles version. 
and the UNSW's version, just to give everybody an idea of how um, it, you know, the principal's version can be contextualized to an university. Uh, if you're interested in the University of Sydney's version or the Bonn University's version, um, please contact the relevant project leads. So for University of Sydney, it'll be Adele, and uh, for Bonn University, it'll be Pro. Okay, uh, and the uh, other thing is that at this point in time, we are reserving all rights to the content at this point in time because it's really just in development uh, and it's we feel that it's probably unsuitable for wider use and adoption, and adoption at this point in time. Um, and as I mentioned, it's planned that a form of the principles version will be made available under a Creative Commons license at a later date. Right, again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me. All right, so without further ado, let's try to look at the mirror board. So, as, um, so for everybody else, you know, you you probably only you only have two functions. One is um, the hand function, which allows you to which allows you to pull yourself around the mirror board. Um, you can zoom in and zoom out using the scroll button. And the other one, which is the most important one, will be that comment button there. So, um, yeah. So that's where you can provide feedback on our PiC training. So you just have to drop the comment on the relevant screens that you want to put your feedback on and that's good to go. Uh, I'll show you an example. So if you click on the comment button, can everybody, you know, for those of you who have access to the mirror board, can just, you can just try doing the, uh, putting in the comments. Just click anywhere to make sure to, um, just to test whether the comments button work. Yep, somebody has a comment there already. So that's John, fantastic. Thanks, John. Um, and most importantly, you know, if uh, please identify yourself in the comments so that you know in in the event that we need some clarifications, we can go back to you. But if you don't want to remain anonymous, that's fine too. Yep, Carl, fantastic. Thanks, Carl. Okay, so there are basically two different colors, all right? Yellow for UNSW, the yellow boards and the green color boards. Uh, the green one will be the so-called generic principles version. Um, so you can see how we have sort of contextualized or tailored it for a specific, for a particular university. Okay. Um, so section one is there, section two, section three. So once you go to section three, that will be the data classification case studies. Um, so it gives you an indicate, it gives you an idea of you know, the different type of case studies we have. But for the purpose of this particular round of consultation, uh, we only have two case study details for the two case studies for you for everybody to review at this point in time. Or it's really just to give everybody an idea of what a case study will look like and what it contained. Um, the final version will have around nine to ten case studies. But just for this consultation, we are providing two examples: case number one and case number three. Same thing that if you know, once you navigate yourself to like section five, uh, which is on the data handling case study, there should, in the final product, we are looking at three, three different branches. But for the purpose of this consultation, we are just providing an example to case number one. Okay. Um, and you will find the details of the case studies at the end of the relevant section. Yeah, one one thing to note, um, the reason why we only provided a, a small number of case studies is, um, as you can see, the case studies um, example is highlighted in yellow, which means it's the UNSW and contextualized version. So the case studies have to be contextualized for the data classifications that are available at your institution. And also the data handling case studies have to be aligned with kind of what platforms and what storage systems are available at different institutions. So um, yeah, so that's why we've only provided a couple of those um, yeah. as an example of how it works at UNSW. But obviously for Sydney, it was completely different. For um, Bond, it was completely different. Like the types of um, data um, and the examples of the cases but the, uh, are the same, but the answers would be obviously be varied depending on the institution. Correct. So for instance, at UNSW and Bond University, our data, class our data classification is highly sensitive, sensitive, private, and public. However, for so we have four levels, whereas at the University of Sydney, they only have three levels, which is highly protected, protected, and public. So that's the reason why, you know, 
the case studies are very contextualized. And same thing uh, as what Jackie mentioned for the data handling case studies, you know, um, each university uses very different platforms and they have very different preferred platforms, so to speak. So that's the reason why you know, we're only providing an example just to give everybody a flavor of what it can look like. Okay, so anyone is, is anyone stuck in the mirror board? Um, it should be fairly straightforward. Uh, as mentioned, you only have two functions. You only have two icons. One is to pull yourself, and the other one is to leave commands. And of course, zooming in and zooming out. Um, so you can put specific feedback on the specific screens that you want to. If there are any general comments or feedback, you can leave them at the end of section eight. You will see this pink color, pinkish color or salmon looking colored um, board. That's where you can put uh, general comments or feedback. Yep, happy to take more questions too, if you like. Hey, Adrian. Uh, John from yep. Hey, John. Yep. Uh, were all of the unis, sorry, I'm not too sure where Bond was located. Are they all New South Wales institutions? Oh, yeah. Yep. So, as, yep. So, as mentioned, we are only showing the um, New South Wales version of it, just to give everybody an, an idea of the contextualized version of it. Uh, if you want to have a look at like the University of Sydney ones or Bond one, you have to contact the project lead directly. Okay. Bond's cool. in Queensland. Yeah. Okay, awesome. I'm just sort of wondering some of the retention things, but that's awesome. Uh, yeah, retention, yeah, it's just, yeah, there's slight differences, but Overall, it's, this, it's pretty similar in terms of the retention period. Yep. It, generally, for kind of this um, state-based variations, they tend to center around um, kind of more sensitive data types, like health data and that sort of thing. And usually, if, um, for introductory training, um, those type of information, we always um, go back to, please contact your ethics department. <laughs> ethics team or your data data support team because um, there needs to be kind of tailored um, support for that for those type of data. Um, in terms of the next stage of the pilot, are you thinking that there would be state face groups or would it be sort of individuals and whoever was putting their hand up? Just I'm thinking in terms of the West Australian unis, a lot of this will be unified a lot of the things that we're talking about will be unified across the state so i wasn't too sure if that was how the pilot was going to be organized or you had oh, any no. ideas on that oh no the, the the when we talk about the pilot phase uh we are only really running the pilot testing at the three universities yeah <laughs> We don't have the. I mean, if you ask me, I would love to run it across all the universities um however we will also make we will make the pilot available for you you to have a play at. Yep, but in terms of the real pilot testing, you'll only be done at the three universities. Yep. Yeah, good team. Um this is yeah. really useful. Um so just for the for the longer term, like this the the principal green versions will be kind of available for the for the university. And then we look at it and go, okay, cool. We're now going to like change the contents of the slides and the case study and the kind of answers to the case studies to suit our needs. Is that kind of general? Correct. Because that, yep. that's great. That's, that's, yep. that's so you, want. you put your colors on it, you put your things on it, you're, you're away. Correct. So, Correct. So for instance, I mean, if you look at some of the green screens, I have like areas where I've highlighted yellow. You can see that, you know, we just change the wordings for the three different universities. Yeah. Um, so same thing for the case studies, you know, we will, yeah, you will just have to look at the case studies and then put in your preferred answers. Yeah. Thanks.
So we will give, um, so we will give, we will open this board for approximately two weeks for everybody to give their feedback. Um, if you're yeah, happy for you to share, it, you know, within your team or within universities too, um, we will send a follow-up email to detail all the steps, including, you know, when's the, the deadline for providing feedback. Um, yeah, because we need some time to collate and consolidate all the feedback before moving to the next phase. Sorry, yeah, just, just for, I'm actually, uh, I'm at the University of Canberra um, and I'm giving effectively this material uh, to new HDR students in two weeks. Um, I've developed a version of this. Um, it might not be this good. So I might uh, be in touch with you if, if I've got, if I get around to implementing some of this and then how it went, um, which I think it's really useful. And, and yeah, yep. 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 So just, yep. So just get in touch with me uh, if you want to use some of it. Um, yeah. Because as mentioned, you know, it's, it looks pretty complete, but actually there's a lot of places that we need to still improve upon. That's the reason why we are saying, you know, at this point in time, it's all rights reserved. Uh, but if you need to some parts of it, yeah, just contact me and we'll have a chat about it. Um, I was just saying, yeah, I agree with Paul. This looks awesome. Um, the mm -hmm. one thing I was thinking, though, this is probably going to be super useful for any university coming in at step zero, trying to get to step one. I'm just wondering if there are areas that it could be flagged within the training that this is an area that if you are at a more advanced level or more experienced or more mature service, then you could include things at this point. So rather than it be sort of very sort of, I know sort of Jackie was saying it's the entry level requirements, mm. but maybe if there was just little, I don't know, flags or notes sort of saying, look here, if you are doing advanced stuff in this area, like whatever big data, text mining or something like that, that could be useful for institutions that are further along in the journey. Yep, 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 definitely. Um... So as mentioned, this is like an introductory baseline training. Uh, and of course you can add others, you can you can connect or link other trainings to it. Um, yeah, because, all right. So at the end of the day, whatever thing that we're developing will be deployed on some sort of LMS, right? Some sort of learning management system. So it's going to be a cost page. So I would, I would think, I would guess that, you know, probably whatever additional supplementary resources would be on that cost page too. So this is just, yeah, this is just one part of that cost base, right? Yeah, that's my thinking. Cool. Uh, all right, so it seems that everybody is able to navigate the mirror board without any issue. So as you know, so there's a public link, it's an open link, you know, just click on it. Uh, right, okay. There's the options. Yep, so Janice, uh, I think the answer is yes, in further down in section four, you would see that we have, we'll be talking about storage options and classification. Yeah. Um, yeah, it seems pretty quiet. Uh, everybody seems to be having fun with Mirror Bot. Um, yeah, we can end this session. We can end this session early if nobody has any other questions or comments. Can I ask a general question just around yeah. the way UNSW is approaching training? Like these, the online modules look fantastic, and I think that they're you know a really nice streamlined way of like thinking about data management. Um, in terms of like online delivery versus sort of in-person kind of training and things, like what's your strategy around like pushing people through the online modules versus like doing kind of more intensive, I guess, engagement with faculties or with, you know, different areas of the university? Um, our current view in terms of our rollout is still the primary point um, will be online. Uh, the the first point will be online in terms of how they're engaging with the material. 
um, just as a way of quickly um, targeting a large cohort of incoming students. And also um, because faculties and schools tend to hold their in induction kind of sessions at various um, times throughout the year. And then after they do their online training, we then tend to follow up with uh, more detailed um, support sessions that go into that we then have to tailor for the faculty. So for example, if we go to medicine, we um, select um, the specific tools that may be more relevant to the medicine HDRs and we provide the, um, that more in-depth um, kind of run through of kind of what support the university can offer those HDRs. So that's the way that we've approached it at the moment um, is that online first, just to make sure that everybody understands the base level expectations and also where just um, how to navigate all the university web pages and um, emails and that sort of thing. So they have all the information up front and then we follow up um, with um, kind of the more, in like you said, more in-depth, more intensive um, mm -hmm. support. And, and we do, and every year we kind of have to um, kind of evaluate based on, um, you know, data on the usage of platforms and that sort of thing, um, which faculties we need to target a little bit more and which, um, yeah, and that sort of thing. Yeah, that sounds very reasonable. <laughs> Sorry, Adrian and Jack, I did have one last question. Would it be possible for you to add a timeline of the implementation plans onto the Miro board, just so we can look and see maybe when, when everyone else can get their grubby mitts on it? <laughs> Sure. I'll yeah. I'll, I'll paste the project timeline again. Yeah, it's um, it me. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, as of today, of course. <laughs> project. Awesome. Well, I think if we um, don't have any more questions, then uh, we might end it there and give everyone a couple of minutes to get to their next meeting. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, brilliant. Thank you so much, um, Adrian and Jackie. That's, uh, yeah, uh, it's a really cool uh, project and um, and really awesome to see such a collaborative project as well coming out of this program. That's, yeah, really exciting. Um, and thank you everyone for your uh, input and feedback. Um, and yep, as um, these guys said, uh, keep, keep it coming for the next couple of weeks. And um, I'm sure that we'll be uh, in touch again soon to uh, let people know how this and other projects in the program are going. See you all. Thank you, everyone.